Welcome to Introduction to Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Utah. I am Dr. Cynthia Furse, and today we'll be talking about voltage and power. If you have ever live, wanted to live off the grid, or if you need an internet base station in a remote area, or perhaps you just want to be able to charge up the batteries on your RV, this lecture is for you. We're going to talk about what is voltage, how do you measure it, what's the polarity, ground, what's power, what's energy, and then let's get real with some interesting applications. Voltage is the energy that's required to move one unit of negative charge, E minus, from point A to point B. Another way to think of this is it's the same energy that's required to lift one unit of positive charge, E, from point B to point A. That's the way I like to think about it. Voltage is equal to potential. Think of the voltage as a stack of positive charges at the top of the hill at point A. This has potential energy. Voltage is a potential difference that's measured between two points. You can see the voltmeter here where we've connected the positive red lead onto A and the common or negative uh, ground lead onto B. V from point A to point V, B, or VAB, is equal to 1.5 volts. That means that VA is 1.5 volts higher than VB. Voltage has polarity. What if I switch my leads? What if I measure with the red lead at point B and the negative lead at point A? Then VBA will be read on the voltmeter as, one, as minus 1.5 volts. That means that VB is 1.5 volts lower than VA. You could stop for a minute if you like and use Multisim to be able to experiment with your voltage and your voltmeter to be able to see this happen. Voltage is always measured relative to a ground. We also call that the reference or the neutral. Here are two cards that show you what symbols we might use for ground. We always define the voltage of the ground as being zero volts. Here's an example of a very simple circuit. This is where we have a battery. It's connected onto two resistors. And we might be interested in knowing what is VC in between these two resistors. Well, we can tell one thing about this particular picture, we know that VAB is 1.5 volts because I bought a 1.5 volt battery. But without having a ground, I can't tell you exactly what VC is. So let's define the ground at a place that's convenient to us. For me, the most convenient place is at the bottom of the battery. So I'm going to install my ground right here at this point. Then I can say, what's VA, what's VB, and what's VC? Let's start with VB. That's the easiest. OK, check this out. VB is directly connected onto the ground, so I know that VB is 0 volts. That's like by definition. I'm going to use three lines to say VB is defined as 0 because that's where I put my ground. Now what about VA? Remember that VA is 1.5 volts above VB. VB is 0, so VA is 1.5 volts. Now what about VC? we can see that these two resistors are equal. That means that the voltage is going to be evenly split between them. The voltage between this point right here and the bottom, which is 0, is 1.5 volts. So VC is going to be halfway in between 1.5 volts and 0, or it's going to be 0 0.75 volts. Now this particular definition of VA, VB, and VC is totally dependent on where I placed my ground. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go, let's go choose a different ground point. This time, let's put our ground right here in between the two resistors. It's legal. We can go ahead and do that. may not be quite as convenient, but let's see what happens. OK, VC is at the point of the ground. So remember, the ground defines our voltage as being 0. So VC is equal to 0. Now, what about VA and, B and VB? Well, we know that VA is 1.5 volts higher than VB. And how about its relationship to VC? Well, because we originally split the voltage here, we're going to still be splitting the voltage. So we can see that VA is going to be 0 0.75 volts higher than VC. So VA is going to be 0 0.75 volts. All right, what about VB? Well, that's going to be 0 0.75 volts lower than VC, so it's going to be negative 0 0.75 volts. 
Let's kind of check ourselves. We know that VAB has to be 1.5 volts. Is that going to be true? VA is 0.75 volts. B VB is negative 0.75 volts. So absolutely, we got our 1.5 volts. Now notice that the relative voltages in this circuit are the same as they were before when we had our ground at the bottom, but the absolute values of these voltages are different. Does it matter? The answer is no. Everything in my circuit can be relative to the ground at any location, and I could do my calculations accordingly. So it doesn't matter where I put my ground, except that I'm most often going to choose it for my calculation convenience. OK, let's go on to the next idea. Let's talk about some real stuff. So what's a really big voltage, and what's a really little voltage? Let's have some ideas in mind so that when we do our calculations, our math, we have an idea if we're getting something that's reasonable. The biggest voltage that I could find in nature is lightning. It's not uncommon for lightning to have 1 billion volts. That's 1 times 10 to the ninth. That is a really big voltage. There's some interesting information on lightning in the reference material at the end of this lecture. High voltage lines also have large voltage. High voltage lines are often 110 kilovolts or higher. And indeed, they're considered high voltage. Your house, your residential construction, has 240 volts for your largest appliances and 120 for most of your general use. Now what's a really small voltage? Neural action potentials, the electric potential that stimulates a single neuron, is a relatively small voltage. That's about minus 55 millivolts. Your cardiac action potential is about the same uh, range. That's minus 100 to plus 50 millivolts. A bird sitting on a power line is another example of a very small voltage. We say the bird can sit on the line without being shocked because it has no potential difference. It's not exactly right. It has a very small potential difference of about 10 millivolts between the left and the right leg, and that is small enough that it doesn't hurt the bird. There's some very interesting research going on at the University of Utah relative to electrodes and uh, neurons that you might be very interested in. The Utah electrode array is a very small array made from silicon that has 10, 10 electrodes by 10 electrodes. Each electrode is like a tiny needle. It's made from silicon. It is conductive. It's connected to an individual line. Like if you look at this big kind of gold line right here, that has a hundred little different lines about the thickness of a hair that come back to a central system. This electrode array can be placed in or in contact with any nerve. For example, it could be stuck on the surface of the brain. This can be used to either receive from the nerves and be able to read their signals, or it can be used to stimulate them. This Utah electrode array is being put into commercial products to help blind people see, deaf people hear, and people who have yet lost the use of their limbs to be able to regain that use or to be able to use bionic limbs as a substitute. Very, very interesting research going on right now. Now let's talk about power. Power is given in watts. That is voltage times current. So watts is volts times amps. So P is equal to VI. Power is also the time rate of change of energy. DW is not watts. DW is energy. That's the change of energy per time. And that would be the power as a function of time. The passive sign convention tells us if a device is consuming power or producing power. Here's how the passive sign convention works. Define a device, shown here as the dark blue box, and one side of the device is A, the other side is B. VAB is the potential across that device. Might be positive, might be negative. Then define the current going into the device in the direction shown here, from plus to minus. The current is always defined as positive in this way. Here's an example. Here's the battery with a resistor. I've chosen a single resistor here, just for your simplicity. The current and we calculated this in Multisim before, is the voltage divided by the resistance, or 1.5 milliamps in this case, if we have a 1.5 volt battery. Now, let's look over here and determine what the voltage across that resistor is going to be. The voltage is going to be IR. I is 1.5 milliamps. The resistance is 1 kiloohms. So the voltage across that resistor is 1.5 volts. Now, let's see what happens with the power. Let's first calculate the power here on the right for the resistor. Well, here's our, here's our device, this resistor, and the voltage across it is 1.5 volts, positive 1.5 volts. And the current is positive 
1.5 milliamps. So the power is going to be 1.5 volts times 1.5 milliamps, or 2.25 milliwatts. Since the power is positive, the resistor is consuming power. That is what we expect. In fact, resistors consume power and convert it into heat or light energy. Now let's come over to this side. We know intrinsically that the battery must be producing power. Let's see if that happens mathematically. When we're looking at this, we're going to consider this to be our device, and the current is coming into the device in the positive to negative direction. The current in this way is 1.5 milliamps positive. The voltage, if we're looking at it in this direction, like from bottom to top, not from top to bottom, from bottom to top, the voltage is going to be negative 1.5 volts. So the power is equal to negative 1.5 volts times positive 1.5 milliamps for a total of negative 2.25 milliwatts. Remember, if the power is negative, that means that the device is producing power instead of using power. Another important feature of power is that the power has to be conserved within a system. There's no place for loose power to be hanging out. So we can see that our power that's produced is negative 2.25 milliwatts. The power that is used is 2.25 milliwatts. And these two things have to be equal and opposite. Now let's talk about the energy. The energy and the um, picture that we use for that is W, the variable we use is W. That's given in joules or kilowatt hours. Most of the things that we're used to measuring in electrical engineering are kilowatt hours, but most of the thing mechanical engineers would be talking about would be joules. They are the same thing. The power is the integrated time, is integrated over time of, I'm sorry, the energy is the integration over time of the power. That means that we take the power and all the power that we might have used all day if T is our day, is going to tell us how much energy we used. One joule is equal to one watt second. So let's see what one kilowatt hour is equal to. One kilowatt hour, and let's balance our units. I need a watt on the bottom and an hour on the bottom in order to cancel these out. One kilowatt hour times one joule per watt seconds times 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour. My minutes cancel out. My seconds cancel out. My watt hours cancel out, leaving me with joules and this K over here. So I get 3,600 kilojoules. One kilowatt hour is 3,600 kilojoules. Now let's figure out what energy you need. How much energy do you, do you need? This is a picture of the internet base station on the mountain above my house. It's a solar powered base station. The power is stored in car batteries, 12 volt batteries. And then the base station, that's the little antenna right there, is a line of sight base station over to Park City from Mountain Peak to Mountain Peak, several miles away. In order to figure out how much solar panel you need, you first are going to make your device as efficient as possible. Figure out how many kilowatts you need. Then you're going to decide how many hours that needs to be able to run. Now when you're considering the number of hours, you want to consider how much time you can actually charge your solar panels, which obviously is only during the day. And in fact, it's only the good days. So if you have dark, rainy days, you need to have enough power stored up. So you take the number of hours, you multiply, the number of appliances in kilowatts times the number of hours you plan to use those, those devices and add it up to get kilowatt hours. Consider the recharge time for dark, for night, dark or snowy days, etc. I've put some interesting links online so that you could calculate this for an application of your interest or perhaps figure out just how much power you're using in your own home. So our summary of voltage and power is we talked about what is voltage and how you measure it. It's polarity, the impact of using a ground and where you place the ground, and what is power and what is energy. Then we talked about some interesting real applications. Now here is, you're wondering what's on the front slide, here's the solar powered neighborhood internet base station at the top of Emigration Canyon. The view from above over to Park City, you can see the mountaintop that it's uh, transmitting to and receiving from is quite a distance away. How do you get all that stuff up there and why do you care about the number of solar panels and the batteries? Well, it's 200 pounds of car batteries carried up by people and by horses, as well as the base station that you can see right here, a couple of the neighbors carrying that up on, the, on a pole. If you have to carry all of this stuff to the top of the mountain, you are going to carry as few solar panels and as few batteries as possible. So now take a look at your own applications, find something interesting, and estimate the amount of solar power that you would need for that application.